So last time we left off um, at how do we multiply, um, add, and subtract complex numbers, and today we'll pick off at how do we divide complex numbers. So the whole recipe for dividing complex numbers is pretty easy. All you have to do to divide complex numbers is to multiply the fraction with the complex conjugate of the denominator. So the only new thing you're learning here is what's a complex conjugate. So if I multiply this fraction by the complex conjugate, we'll see what that is in a second. But right now, let's see what the math is going on at. So if I multiply this fraction with the complex conjugate um, of the denominator, I also have to divide the same by the complex conjugate of the denominator to maintain neutrality. Okay, so it's like if 5 is equal to 5, well, if I multiply this side by 2 and divide this side by 2, then the answer is still going to be 5, right? So if I want to maintain that neutrality in the equation, if I multiply the equation with something, I also have to divide it if I don't want to change the equation in any form. Um, moving on, what's a complex conjugate? Basically, a complex conjugate is just, um, it's the complex number, but with the opposite sign in front of the i. So if a complex number can be written as x plus i y, then the complex conjugate of that number is simply x minus i y. If this number um, had a negative here, then of course the complex conjugate would have a positive, okay? Um, another important thing to remember here is that if you multiply a complex number with the complex conjugate, you always get a real number. So I'll do an example and we'll figure out what that means in a second, but this is really important to understand. A complex number multiplied by its complex conjugate always gives a real number. So here... I have z1 is equal to 2 plus i and z2 is equal to i plus 2i. 1 plus 2i, I'm sorry. So what's the complex conjugate of z1? Well, like I said, it's just the same number but with the opposite sign in front of i. So it's pretty simple. So there's that. For z2, the complex conjugate is this number. So now the question is asking us what's z1 divided by z2? Well, remember, the recipe here tells me if I want to divide these two numbers, um, I have to multiply it by the complex conjugate of the denominator. Let me just switch this a little bit. I'm going to go z2 divided by z1, okay? So in this case, my recipe is z2 divided by z1, and then if I want to get the answer, I have to go z1 complex conjugate, and then I also have to divide by the complex conjugate of z1. Let's see where this takes us. So z2 is 1 plus 2i. z1 is 2 plus i. So then I have to multiply this by the complex conjugate of the denominator, and I get 2 minus i on the top and 2 minus i on the bottom. So if I FOIL this out, then I get 1, or I'm sorry, 2 minus i plus 4i minus 2i squared, okay? For the denominator, I'm left with 4 minus 2i plus 2 right? And then minus i squared. Okay, let's see where that leads us. Um, 4 minus 2i. I'm sorry, this is, this should be a plus 2i, right? Because i multiplied by 2 is positive 2i. So on the top, I'm left with 2 minus 2i squared plus 3i, and on the bottom, I'm left with 4, these two numbers cancel out, minus i squared, okay? So i squared, remember, can be written as negative 1. So on the top, I'm left with 2 
plus 2 plus 3i, and on the bottom, I'm left with 4 plus 1. Okay, so I'm left with 4 plus 3i divided by 5 as my answer. Now remember, a complex conjugate multiplied by the complex number always gives a real number as an answer, and here the real number that I got is 5. Okay, so this is how you divide complex conjugates. I think dividing two complex numbers is probably the hardest thing you'll see because you have to introduce this idea of a complex conjugate. Um, but if you do this problems like one or two times, it, it's really not that hard. Now let's move on. So it's so far, um, we've talked about complex numbers, but I told you that they're composed of an imaginary part. So you might be wondering, do complex numbers actually have any usefulness in math and physics? Um, and the answer is yes, they do. Um, and Euler's formula really helps us connect imaginary and complex numbers with real numbers, okay? So, basically, I know that any complex number can be written as z is equal to x plus i y. Then Euler came along and he said that any imaginary number can also be written as a sum of a cos and a sine term. Okay, we'll see how he got that and we'll see what this means in a second. But really, you can convert anything that has an imaginary number into real numbers as well. Um, and we're going to see that in a second right now, how you do it. So, if I look at z, it has a real part, um, which is x, and then it has an imaginary part, which is y. So a lot of values of x and y will satisfy this equation. In fact, there might even be an infinite number of values of x and y that satisfy this equation. So I can go ahead and I can plot all of these x's and all of these y's um, on a graph. And if I do that, well, then I get some sort of straight line that looks like this. So this is called the complex plane, right? This, this plane that you see, this piece of paper, on your piece of paper, if you look directly down at it and you see kind of this plane, um, this is called the complex plane because there's a real part and there's an imaginary part here. So let's see what happens. Um, at, let's pick any point on this, on this graph, and I'll pick this point over here. Um, it has an x value and a y value, okay? The y value is this guy, so that means this whole height is y, um, and this whole base is x, okay? And then I'm going to call the hypotenuse r. So this is, this, this is a right angle triangle with a height of y, a base of x, and a hypotenuse of r, and of course there's some theta associated with it as well. Okay. So, let's bring back grade 10 mathematics Soka Toa. Sine theta can be written as opposite over hypotenuse. The opposite is y right? It's the opposite to this angle. And the hypotenuse is r. So I'm going to rearrange that for to solve for y, and I get this equation. Similarly, cos can be written as adjacent divided by hypotenuse. That's what this means, adjacent divided by hypotenuse. Adjacent, it's the side that's adjacent to the angle theta. So the side that's adjacent, or meaning that touches angle theta is x. So then I have x over r, and I can solve this for x, and I get this. Okay, now I have some value, a real value for y, and I have a real value for x. It turns out that the hypotenuse r can also be written according to Pythagorean theorem as x squared plus y squared, and then I square root this, right? Because one side is x, the other is y, and then I can use the Pythagorean theorem to get r. If I want to find this theta, then I use toa, or tan, which is opposite over adjacent, okay? So then theta is simply inverse or second tan, y divided by x, okay? So inverse tan y divided by 
um, X or arc tan as they call it um, it's on your on your on your calculator you press second tan and then you'll get theta okay so this is how you find theta so I know how to get theta I know how to get Y I know how to get X so far going back to Z is equal to X plus I Y I can go ahead and replace the value of x with the new x I found out and I can go ahead and replace the value of y with the new y that I found out. Okay, So you can see that this r is a common value in this whole equation. So I can factor that r out. If I factor an r from the first part, all I'm left with is a cos theta. If I factor r from the second part, I'm left with i sine theta. Okay, so I'm left with r um, cos theta plus i sine theta. If you go back, you'll see that Euler's formula basically is that e i theta is equal to cos theta plus i sine theta. So I can rewrite this part as e i theta. Remember, Euler's formula says that e i theta is equal to cos theta plus i sine theta. So I can replace this part with e to the exponent i theta. Okay? So, therefore, z can be written as r multiplied by e to the exponent i theta. Well, if z can be written as that, the complex conjugate of z turns out to be just r e to the exponent negative i theta. Remember, a complex conjugate is just the same quantity but with an opposite sign in front of i. So now, what happens if I multiply z with its complex conjugate? Well, I know that I'm going to get some real number. Okay, well, let's, let's do this. If I multiply them together, um, well, these two bases of the exponent i theta are the same. Remember, we're taught in exponents that when the base of an exponent is the same and they're being multiplied, then I can go ahead and add the exponents. If I add i theta to negative i theta, I'm left with 0. So e to the exponent 0 is just equal to 1. In fact, anything to the exponent 0 is equal to 1. So z multiplied by its complex conjugate equals to r squared. So r squared is just equal to z multiplied by its complex conjugate, um, or simply it's equal to the square root, r is equal to the square root of z multiplied by its complex conjugate. Now, it turns out that I can also find the magnitude of z by simply square rooting r, okay? Um, you can see how the reverse works. If I want to solve for these z's, just the magnitude, I don't care about the signs. If I don't care about the signs, then I'm just left with z squared, okay? So then z is equal to r to the exponent 1 half, or it's just the square root of r. So um, this is really important as well. Now let's do a practice problem to bring this all together. So if z is equal to 1 plus i, then what's the value of r? What's the magnitude of z? And what's the face angle theta? I forgot to tell you one thing, and that's um, this form is called the polar form. OK? So it's the polar form because there's i theta, there's i, and there's sine theta. Um, because of this angular dependence, this is the polar form, okay? So this is um, a very kind of um, opposite of what you're used to seeing. We're used to seeing the Cartesian version of this, right? In all the classes that we've done so far, probably, you're used to seeing Cartesian coordinates. But now you're going to have to start getting used to something called polar coordinates. Um, and these are coordinates that involve angles. Okay. So remember, this is the Cartesian form, and this here is the polar form. So sometimes they'll ask you, okay, they might tell you if z is equal to this, what's the polar form? And if, if, it, if they're asking for the polar form, they're basically just asking you to put this into this form. Okay, so we're, we're just going to do a simple example for now. Um, 
we'll do more complex examples later if you guys want me to do them. So if z is equal to i plus a uh, 1 plus i, then what's the value of r, what's the magnitude of z, and what's the face angle theta? The first thing is probably the easiest thing to find here is r. So remember, z multiplied by its complex conjugate is just r squared, right? So that means 1 plus i, and then I take the complex conjugate, which is 1 minus i, that's going to give me r squared, okay? So I'm left with 1 minus i plus i, and then minus i squared. So these two cancel out. And remember, i squared is equal to negative 1. So then I'm left with 1 minus minus 1, or basically 2. So r is equal to 2. Now, that shouldn't be too hard to calculate. So we know what r is. Now remember, what's the magnitude of z? The magnitude of z, it's basically the square root of r, or it's the square root of 2. So remember, a square root can be written as a fraction, okay? So if I have any exponent in the form of a over b, the top part represents an exponent. Here, the exponent is just 1. The bottom part, so the exponent here is 1, the bottom part here represents what root are you talking about? Are you talking about the square root as we are in here? If this was a cube root, then I'd have a 3 over here and so forth. Okay, so this is kind of important to know that I can write um, e exponents in this form. Okay, exponent divided by the root. We're going to do this quite often, so try to understand it right now. So we got the value of r, we got the value of z, um, and now the question, of course, is that what's the value of theta? Well, theta is given by tan theta um, y divided by x. So, In this example, um, what we'll do is we know that z is equal to x plus i y. If I compare this with what I'm given, it's, a, it's quite obvious that x is equal to 1 and y is also equal to 1, right? This i is being multiplied with a 1. So both y and x are just equal to 1. So sometimes you're going to have to do this guesswork. They'll, they'll give you um, z is equal to 1 plus i um, something or 1 plus 2i. Then you'll figure out that okay 1 that corresponds to x and the 2 corresponds to y. So this is something you're going to have to figure out um, but it's really not that hard. So if tan theta is equal to 1 then if, I, if I'm looking for theta, sorry, if I'm looking for theta, then all I do is I go second tan on my calculator, I put a 1 here, right, and if your calculator is in degree modes, you'll get 45 degrees, um, if your calculator is in uh, radian modes, you'll get pi over 4 radians, okay? So, with this, we're done complex numbers, um, so we'll move on by discussing the classical wave equation in a lot more detail. Uh, it's really important that you understand complex numbers because we'll be using them a lot. I hope this video helped. Good luck.